Hello, and thank you for joining us. The Canadian Mountain Network and Mountain Sentinels Alliance welcome you all for our dialogue on this United Nations International Mountain Day event for 2022, themed Women Move Mountains. We offer greetings to all our panelists who are Indigenous elders, knowledge holders, scientists, learners, and women extraordinaire. And a warm welcome to the attendees joining us from across the globe. Members of our panel and the host teams are situated across North America. I would like to start by acknowledging that we are on the ancestral lands and territories of numerous and diverse Indigenous nations, and we pay tribute to their heritage and legacy as we strengthen ties with the communities we serve while taking concrete actions towards meaningful reconciliation. We recognize the historical trauma and triumphs that many different cultures, lands, and nations have continuously faced across North America. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work with Indigenous communities in advancing their vision and aspirations on this land. We pay respect to all Indigenous peoples from all nations across North America. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers and honour their leaders. This recording has been modified from the original due to technical difficulties and therefore not all content is available. We were grateful to have had this event opened by Ava Hamilton. Eva Hamilton is Arapaho. She's a filmmaker, author, historian, public speaker, and water protector. Among her films is the documentary, Everything Has a Spirit. She is active with many groups and issues, including people of the sacred land and rising voices, climate resilience through indigenous earth sciences. Thank you, Ava, for opening our time together in a good way. This event was moderated by Nicole Olivier, Programs Manager for the Canadian Mountain Network. For IMD 2022, the Canadian Mountain Network and Mountain Sentinels partnered in hosting this online event for many reasons. Both of our organizations work towards supporting mountain environmental research and support Indigenous communities, knowledge holders and scientists as they work towards climate and conservation solutions with all ways of knowing and doing. And both of our organizations are strongly female-led a fitting partnership for this year's theme, Women Move Mountains. Beyond our organizations around the world, women play a key role in the stewardship, conservation, economic development, and management of mountains, including the keeping and sharing of traditional knowledge. IMD 2022 focuses on the need to empower women as farmers, artisans, entrepreneurs, community leaders, mothers, and mountain women and girls so that they can more effectively participate in decision-making and resource management. We are taking this IMD 2022 as an opportunity to raise awareness about the need to empower and uplift women. By sharing excellence, opportunities, and capacity development, IMD can promote gender equality and therefore contribute to improve social justice, livelihoods, and resilience. Women have unique gifts to be celebrated. And in this panel, we bring together a diverse group of women from across Turtle Island, North America, who are moving mountains and the impact of each of their work is reaching far beyond mountains, creating the path forward for us all. To have this meaningful conversation, the history and significance of these lands for indigenous peoples must be included. We must be ready to participate in discussion together with indigenous knowledge holders and scientists, elders and youth, and be inclusive of a diversity of genders and backgrounds and lived experiences to understand and care for these lands with multiple ways of knowing and doing. The panel opens with our first speaker, Coralie mcguire Surrett, Executive Director of the Ontario Native Women's Association. Cora is focused on reclaiming Indigenous women's leadership by addressing systemic discrimination and creative innovative solutions to key safety issues that Indigenous women face. Thank you, Cora. We've had, uh, you know, as collective Indigenous people, I think throughout all of North America and all around the world uh, internationally. And so I'll be talking a bit about our work here at ONWA and some of the work we do. And one part of the work that we do as an organization is we always start with vision. You know, it's one part of the teachings here um, that we've incorporated as an organization is we always start with vision and purpose. And so when we look at, um, you know, on one who we are, we, we really take um, those cultural teachings into practice. And so one part of it is really being able to create that we're building on what to be a center of excellence 
for systemic policy and addressing those systemic changes that need to happen in, in society. And so one way we do it is through our strategic plan, which is really looking at how we address violence and key safety issues. And one of them is Mother Earth, um, that we're uh, looking at what can we do as an organization and as Indigenous women. And we're not always just kind of saying somebody should do something. So really taking that action focus that Ava was speaking to. So we can go to the next slide. And so the key, key areas of work that we do, this is um, a change wheel. So what we do is we look at what key issues are we gonna focus on as an organization? And then what we do is we break down that issue systemically on what changes we need to happen um, within that issue. So one example you can look at is like, you know, we address uh, human trafficking as an organization and really looking at, when you're looking at what indigenous women do to move mountains um, within a social aspect of it, uh, we're currently running the largest Indigenous anti-human trafficking program in Canada, uh, focused uh, specifically on Indigenous women's safety. And here in Canada, uh, um, Indigenous women are overrepresented uh, within human trafficking and, and, and whatnot. And so what we were able to do is really engage with women on the ground in community and be able to ask them like, what is it is needed? What's that gap? And what would you like to see as a result to, to make this change and to make this impact? So as a result of that, it took us five years. We then created uh, a strategy with the province. Uh, we then created programmings uh, to be implemented all across communities, uh, in 10 communities right now across the province and all of those pieces there. And we also changed legislation with the Ontario government as well. And that all came from engaging directly with Indigenous women on the ground, who are the experts. Um, they're the experts on the issues they're facing and helping them you know, reclaim their voice and so you can really see how, you know, there was this issue that was identified by women in community. We need to do something. We engage and then we did something. And so that's really what we're doing in our next step as an organization working on along the wheel is looking at what do we need to do with Mother Earth and taking up our responsibilities as Indigenous women once again and looking at what we can do to help move those mountains into that right direction. Next slide. So... A lot of the work we do is based off of, uh, we do a two-eyed seeing approach in the organization. That's what I really liked about hearing from the Mountain Network and the work that you're doing about really taking both traditional practices, indigenous uh, knowledge, uh, beliefs and systems and looking at uh, you know, mainstream approaches and, and practices. That's what we do as an organization. We really do a two-eyed seeing approach in the work that we do that incorporates both traditional knowledge and Western healing practices and really blending them both um, in, in every in which way we can do it. And part of it is about reclaiming, restoring, reconciling and recognizing um, in those values in all the work that we do. Okay, next. And so these are just some of our kind of our four strategic goals uh, that we're doing as an organization. Um, it's everything that really leads to like systemic change that, uh, as an organization, how can we really make that change that Indigenous women have a right to? Next slide. And, you know, everything that we do really has a legacy. And, um, you know, it doesn't always have to be that colonial legacy of, you know, here's the negative impact and whatnot. We all have a responsibility and obligation and we all have a purpose. You know, Creator gave a, each and every one of us a purpose in life since it's our responsibility to figure out what that purpose is and to act upon it. And so when we're looking at some of the work we do here and what Indigenous women have done for generations, um, it's really been able to celebrate and strengthen uh, the resiliency of Indigenous women all across, uh, all across the globe, you know, on Turtle Island as Nicole was staying here and looking at what are we gonna do for our legacy? How are we going to, um, the actions we do today are gonna support our grandchildren's grandchildren. And I think this is like a really key component in time right now that we need to take up our responsibility and look at what issues are being faced in your current community right now that you can act upon at an individual level. And then we can look at the collective movement um, after that. Slide next. And uh, we can probably just go to the next slide because I do have a video I'd like to actually uh, show you. So this one here is, 
Uh, because of all of the work that we, we do as an organization, we really looked at, um, when we incorporated all those pieces, here's our, our one year impact we did last year alone. Uh, through 51 programs, we supported 58,000 program participants, um, 95,000 direct one-on-one -on -one services, and we had an overall 200,000 uh, 200, total community impact. Uh, but the numbers are kind of only one part of our story. Um, I would just kind of like to close with uh, giving you a, a picture, a visual. Uh, it just really does go to show like when you have your purpose and your vision and your, your team that you can look at what you can do collectively that, you know, one person could not have did this alone uh, in all of the work that we've did, but it really did take a, a collective movement of Indigenous women to continue to take up our responsibilities and look at what, what can we do and then bringing everybody together and saying, look at what are some of the solutions which um, Indigenous women have the knowledge. Uh, it's just a matter of listening to them uh, hearing them and amplifying their voices. And so with that, I just want to say to you, Rich, for listening to me today. Thank you, Cora, for sharing that amazing work. Wow, you guys have really been busy. Um, so thank you so much. That I'm sure has really far reaching impacts past um, past the the people in your, your community that are directly benefiting from all of that. I'm going to introduce our second panelist now. This is um, Louise Mistal. She is the executive director of the Sky Island Alliance. Um, okay. All right, I had to unmute myself. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I am the executive director as um, was said of Sky Island Alliance. And I um, am really honored to be among this community of women and leaders. Um, oops, let me go back. Um, leaders, I think for all of us as women, we know how important it is to have a strong community of fellow women. So um, I'm feeling special to be invited here today. So thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to introduce you a little bit to where I'm working, the Sky Island region. And I'm coming to you today from Tucson, uh, Arizona, which is on the land of Tona Odom, Pasquayaki, and other indigenous peoples. And our work throughout the Sky Island region on both sides of the US-Mexico border takes place on indigenous lands. So I'm way down south, Arizona, Sonora, and the Sky Islands, if you haven't heard of them, are these really beautiful uh, forested mountains that rise up out of desert and grassland seas. And they're a special place um, in, in the world with Sonoran Desert, our beautiful Suaros um, coming right up to these tall mountains that go, go up to as high as 10,000 feet um, and really diverse habitat here, beautiful um, landscapes. There's 55 individual sky islands in the Sky Island region. Um, this is our oak woodland, which is very characteristic of the Sky Islands. and um, this is a look at where we are in the world. So down south here, um, Sonora and Arizona, and there's a lot going on in this region um, where the Sonoran Desert is meeting the forested mountains. It's a crossroads of many different plants and animals. There's a vast diversity of life found here. And um, it's also a cultural crossroads. So um, in the United States, the Coronado National Forest, which manages 12 of these sky islands, consults with 13 different um, tribes. And um, there's many indigenous people in, on the Mexican side of the border as well who are very connected to these lands. So our work as Sky Island Alliance is to protect and restore the diversity of life and lands in this region. And we're the only organization that's working to safeguard the entire Sky Island region and this amazing diversity of wildlife and plants that depend on it. And I came to this work actually growing up in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Um, I'm a mountain girl through and through. I grew up at 8,000 feet and um, really the mountains kind of helped raise me and shape me for sure. Um, and when I first came to the Sky Islands, it took me a little while to fall in love because they're very different than our big Rocky Mountains that you know stretch all the way up into Canada. It's these smaller isolated ranges, each with their own um, wonderful characteristics. And But I, I have truly fallen in love with them over the years. And um, 
It's partly because of the amazing work I've been able to do at Sky Island Alliance with a team of other women, which is a special experience for sure to be uh, leading an organization with other women. So we uh, work to protect the diversity in life, of life and lands in the region by focusing on water, which is super important for people and wildlife. Uh, wildlife and making sure they have connected open space they need to move around and people, um, restoring people's sense of place in the Sky Islands and building the science that's needed to protect this place. So I'm a scientist by training and I, I come to this from a science background. Um, and I like to share this, um, this is a little smattering of some of the projects we do with um, studying springs, uh, studying wildlife movement with cameras, uh, restoration work to restore native plants into important habitats. But I love this map that our um, wildlife specialist Megan Bethel uh, designed that has, you may notice, no international border uh, on the map. Um, this region does span the US-Mexico border. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's um, become a real area of our focus because of the, the border wall that's um, you know, enacting violence against the land, against the people that live here and the wildlife. Um, the only place in um, in the, the uh, world really where black bear and jaguar are found together. There are jaguars here, super amazing critters um, and just really special habitats here in the Sky Islands. Um, the diversity of life with reptiles. And we have wonderful uh, tropical uh, birds that are found here, like the elegant trogon pictured here and the kawadi. Um, so just some really special animals found in this place and amazing diversity. Um, so one of the things that we um, think about when I mentioned, oh, I wanted to show you a skunk. So as I mentioned, water is um, a key piece of focus and it's really important both um, for wildlife and for people in the region. Uh, we, we look at spring ecosystems across the region. There's um, Arizona amazingly is the second driest state in the nation, but it has the highest number of map springs. Um, so these water sources can be small or large, but very important for life. Um, and, and the diversity of life. And animals need to, of course, be able to move around to get to, to water on the landscape and find each other and find food um, to survive and thrive. And so uh, this is a look out um, from the Huachuca Mountains on the US-Mexico border. Um, you can see this beautiful uh, connected landscape. And over the last few years, this is what has been built into this landscape, um, a border wall that's impassable to wildlife um, and uh, is really destructive and um, damaging. And um, like so many borders around the world drawn by colonizers, this border was problematic from the start and has become much more problematic as the border has become militarized and it has in, caused really um, intense damage to Tono Odom uh, people as well as the wildlife and the land. Um, and so we're working to bring attention to the border wall. Uh, we are studying the movement of wildlife in this area. You can see some more of this in the, the mountains. They've actually blown up mountains to build this wall. They've been bulldozing mountains. Um, but people, ecosystems, and wildlife transcend political boundaries. And that's been a lot of my work um, and my focus um, over the last few years is really, um, oh yes, I wanted to share this um, view of the border and all the indigenous people who did not used to have a militarized border um, intersecting their, their traditional lands and were able to move around um, just like the wildlife need to, you know, still. And um, um, yeah, it's the border is really, um, <laughs> it's really tough tough subject. But what I've been working to do, and Sky Island Alliance has been working to do, is to connect people across the border. So like I said, we're working in Arizona and Sonora. Um, part of our work includes holding and building a vision among many different organizations and within the community of a connected 
Sky Islands, uh, thriving Sky Islands, and um, our name is Sky Island Alliance. And we do a lot of our work in alliance with other organizations and particularly in Mexico with landowners and community members. And so we um, have been uh, spending a lot of effort working with young people, particularly young women in Mexico to raise up those voices. I think, um, you know, I'm working in a very uh, male dominated, male white dominated conservation, land conservation kind of sphere. And so what I've seen in my work over the years is that as women, it's often, it's often us who are holding a vision, who are helping show where we can get to and what beautiful things we can build and create and ensuring that all the people that are involved in this work are cared for as full people and um, can really do their best in this work. And so I, I um, look forward to getting to talk with you all a little more through the discussion about my experience as a, as a woman and um, in the Sky Islands. And thank you, I'll stop there to let the next panelist speak. Wow. That the image with the, the visual of the, the boundaries is really striking and it really does hit home when you see the impact that, that borders have and on animals and, and the, the people who, who um, have for eternity inhabited those areas. So um, I'm gonna turn it now to our next panelist. This is Atea Sespuch. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm sorry, Atea. Uh, Atea is a doctoral student in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy and Management at UC Berkeley, focusing on Indigenous sovereignty and resurgence, Indigenous language revitalization, environmental justice, and energy infrastructure. So welcome, Atea. So hi, my name is Atea. Um, I'm going to be talking about my research, um, in, a small portion of my research in this talk that I'm calling Contesting Endangerments, Indigenous Sovereignty, environmental protection and cacti. And I'm gonna be going fast because I have a lot of slides and a lot of material to be uh, pushing through. But I always start with my introduction in the Ute language, uh, which we call Nu'apagap. So Mike, Ninainia Teasas Puch, Nina Ninia Yokupi Wakoshke, Bian Kitty Hollow, Kaguchin, Mod Hollow Egip, Tagurchen Anton Hollow Egip, Moan Larry Saspuch, Kuchichin Francis Sekakaku Egip. Kunichin Homi Sekakaku Ikep, Nuka Vernal Utah Kanivet Ti Ayak Punikinam. So I told you um, my name, um, and in our traditional introductions, we introduce our whole family so that whoever we're meeting can place us within um, the tribe or their own web of relations. So I uh, just told you who my parents and grandparents are, and they're pictured here, and I wanted to name them as well to call them into this space because uh, my work and myself, I'm really grounded in uh, my connection to my ancestors and have been studying the language, which I'm going to lift up a little bit in this talk. Um, and just on the theme of, you know, women move mountains, of course, within um, the Ute language, uh, our bands are... Um, we, we are uh, born into the band of our mother. So my mom is actually um, Lakota and Assiniboine, and that's where I'm enrolled. Um, but my dad is Northern Ute, and I was born on the Northern Ute Reservation. I'm calling you today from the Northern Ute Reservation in Northeastern Utah. Um, and so a lot of my work is situated with um, my dad's tribe, uh, but I'm born into my mom's tribe. And then for my dad, I'm born into my dad's mother's band, which is um, now White River, but we used to be called Yambataka or the Carrot Eaters. Um, so just lifting up that um, our, our culture really values the importance of women and um, that's shown in the way that we are born into their clan. And of course, women give life, which within our culture is, you know, something that men cannot do. So we have a, a power that men do not have, and we're really um, valued as, as women in youth culture. Um, so, as uh, Nicole mentioned, I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley, um, and prior to starting this work, I worked as an environmental protection specialist here on the Ute Reservation, um, and in this position, I, um, I was really talented at it, but I started the position right after I graduated from um, 
college for my undergrad. And so I was in my early 20s and people just did not take me seriously. You know, I was talking to other oil executives and um, just other, you know, men in the in this job position and people didn't believe what I was saying. Um, and so that's really why I started to get or decided to continue this work um, in a PhD. I thought if I have a title, if I have a label behind me, you know, maybe then people will listen to me and will believe what I'm saying. So as a lot of our other speakers have mentioned, it was just hard to be in, you know, conservation environmental fields that are just so heavily dominated by men. Um, so to situate my work, um, this here shows the darker blue, shows the traditional Ute homelands. Um, and here's my band, the Yampataka Caradito, as you can see, we were in Colorado, but we were forced into Utah. And so this is where my reservation is now, the Uinta and Ore Reservation. So this is where I'm calling from. Um, and I just wanted to note this because, because we were removed from our homelands, you can see the lands that we're at now, none of the bands that are labeled here actually were, had homelands right here where our reservation is. And that's important because we don't have a lot of cultural um, plant species here. We don't have a lot of sacred sites where our reservation is now, which I mentioned because um, the tribe's main source of economic revenue, it comes from oil and gas development. Um, and I think this is in part enabled because we don't have a, such a strong connection to these lands. Our homelands are in the Rocky Mountains, you know, and so I think it would be a different story if people were proposing to put oil wells in our in our mountains and our sacred sites because we are mountain people we lived in the mountains um but because we actually got removed to this basin we're in the uenta basin um i think it helps enable uh, us to engage in oil and gas development and it just wanted to note that we're in a really remote location or about three hours from the nearest urban center so Actually, the revenue from oil and gas development enables our tribal members to continue living on the reservation when there are no job opportunities. So we're in a really difficult position, but um, oil and gas really helps our tribal members have a means to feed ourselves, to live, to house ourselves. Um, and so I'm studying some of these really complex relationships between land and oil and gas development in my research. But for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on environmental policy. So. Um, the reservation in the reservations in the United States are um, held in trust for tribes by the federal government. So they're um, they have to adhere to federal environmental policies. And so um, I've listed here a lot of the different federal agencies that have jurisdiction over tribal lands. You can see it's a lot. Many of their offices are far away in Denver and Salt Lake, hours away from the reservation. And the decisions that they make very often do not include the tribe. And so the environment and environmental protection on the reservation has become a very complex issue um, with, that comes into head with tribal sovereignty, with the tribe's ability to manage our own lands as, as we see fit. Um, and you can see here, this is um, an outline of the reservation. And through multiple federal policies, a lot of the land in the reservation has been taken out of tribal control and given to um, private landowners. So the pink is private landowners. This orange is the tribal lands. Uh, yellow is the Bureau of Land Management and the green is the US Forest Service. But this whole boundary is what the reg reservation originally was. So you can see a lot of our lands, I think it's like 70% um, were taken away from tribal control. But this is still the reservation boundary. Um, and this checkerboard of land ownership really causes a lot of tensions around how environmental policies are enacted on the ground. So private landowners in the pink here um, they are not subject to federal regulation. So all of these uh, different agencies have no jurisdiction on, on, on the private lands, but the tribal lands are subject to all of this um, additional review. And that comes into a head, um, particularly, I want to highlight this cactus species, which is endemic to the reservation. Um, it's actually two species, but I'm just gonna call them sclerocactus because they're closely related. Um, but they occur on the reservation and they're protected through the Endangered Species Act. Um, however, um, tribal lands are subject to protect, subject to the Endangered Species Act um, for plant species, but the neighboring private landowners are not subject to that same protection. So for plants, the Endangered Species 
Act doesn't apply to plants on private lands. So they can kill all the cactus they want, but on um, tribal lands, they're extremely protected. And I wanna note that this cactus doesn't have any cultural significance for us as you people. Um, and so we really don't have a strong connection to this plant, but it's offered a ton of protection and precludes the tribe's ability to um, place well pads on the reservation, whereas the neighboring private landowner can put a well wherever they want and take the oil you know, from underneath our lands. So this has caused um, one woman to say, you know, the federal government cares more about a cactus than it does about you people, because we see oil and gas development as enabling our ability to live. And so they're valuing the life of the cactus over ourselves. Um, and I wanted to highlight that the Ute language, Nu'apoka, has also been um, designated by uh, UNESCO as being endangered. And it's really a lot of the Ute women who have taught me my language um, that helps me connect to the land and to myself. And so I wanted to highlight this kind of contesting endangerment between an endangered cactus species and an endangered language, you know, and really highlight and lift up that um, environmental protection policies need to um, consult with tribes, they need to lift up indigenous sovereignty rather than come against indigenous sovereignty um, to really protect the lands and the peoples that are of this land. Um, and so that's my main takeaway. Um, thank you so much for listening. I hope I didn't run over time. Uh, looking forward to the questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atea. And again, wow, um, the visuals that um, you guys are you're providing today it really does hit home even more so the, the impact on the, the, the land and the, the current colonial boundaries are having on ways of life and, and species and, and, and how all the politics plays into that as well. So thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna introduce our next panelist now. This is Kim McMullen. Kim is the founder of Girl in the Wild, a not-for-profit organization that provides free, life-changing, confidence-building camps for teen girls in wild spaces. Thank you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, am I off mute? I am. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm coming to you today from beautiful Golden, British Columbia. Um, I am on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kutunaha people, and it's also home to the Kinbasket people. And it's not lost on me how um, incredibly uh, lucky I am to live, work, um, and play here on these lands. Um, I'm excited to tell you about Girl in the Wild and share some stories with you. So our teeny tiny scrappy little um, nonprofit Girl in the Wild provides free confidence building camps to struggling teenagers who um, identify as girls, non-binary, um, or genderqueer in wild spaces. And this you see here is the beautiful Selkirk Mountains. And here's our teeny tiny little group um, enjoying these wild spaces. Um, it's really important to us to connect youth today who are struggling with these open spaces where they can literally come, in this case, 2,200 meters above the sea for seven days with complete strangers and uncover their own value and the value of others. Um, the problem we saw and why we started this organization was obviously that our youth are struggling or they are struggling with Oh my goodness, they're struggling with eating disorders. They're struggling with body dysmorphia. They're struggling with social anxiety. They're struggling with depression. They're struggling with suicidal thoughts and self-harm. They're struggling. It's really, really difficult. And it's really, really heavy right now. Our solution is our vision, which is to eradicate self-loathing for good. What this means is that our lofty goal is really to see that the generation after the next, if we do our work and do our work well, will have no idea what it feels like to hate themselves. Literally would have to read in history books what self-loathing is and think, oh my God, our ancestors were nuts. Why would they ever think ill of themselves? This is what we're trying to do. And we're doing it through connecting youth to each other and to the land through adventure and vulnerability in wild spaces. What we really feel is the magic of mountains. And many of these youth who come to us have not spent much time, if any, in 
in wild spaces. And so really bringing them home to the simplicity and to the land is something that really helps them rise up and see their potential. And you can see, here's just a couple of shots of some of our camps. This is us coming over the pass on the last day of our, of our camps. Um, here's another on our way to Mother Lode Lakes, another camp, um, and this was just our last cohort in, in 2022. And the joy that comes and, and what would be a beautiful picture is a side by side of what we see on day one and this that we see on day seven, and really these youth finding um, finding their worth in themselves through their time in the mountains together. So I'm just going to tell you a story instead of telling you kind of about um, our organization specifically, I wanted to share a story of just one youth who who came to camp. Um, and I have so many of these stories and every youth has a different and beautiful outcome. And if you if you want to have a beer or wine or tea with me anytime, I can speak to him blue in the face about the incredible journeys these youth have been on and, and what they've taught me and learned themselves and, and how they're growing and, and, and changing um, the world, in, in my opinion. So this is Elf. Um, their pronouns are they, them, and so that's how I will speak of them. Um, Elle came to us, this is Elle on, on day one at camp, and, and they actually, um, at this moment, said, I, I need some time by myself. First day. Um, they came to us, they struggle with, they have bipolar disorder. Um, a lot of self-deprecating speech around that, so called themselves crazy, would, would always say, here's my opinion, but you know, I'm crazy. Um, this is my thought, but you know, I'm a little crazy. Um, always kind of sold themselves um, as somebody who, who had lack of worth because of that diagnosis. Um, they also really struggled with uh, body dysmorphia and gender dysmorphia as, as well, came from a family that was very clear with them that they had wanted them to be born a boy. And so as they had developed into a, a um, expected, um, you know, feminine form, they really were uncomfortable in their, in their own skin. They also had said to us in their application, I cannot be friends with girls. Girls don't like me. Um, so I was a bit standoffish in the, bit, in the beginning. They had a lot going on, but camp and mountains and people. And so as we, and I'm, I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest um, version of Elle's story, um, uh, but it was pretty remarkable to bear witness to. So we have vulnerable conversations when we're in um, mountain spaces and, and we talk about what we're struggling with um, and, and really create a safe space to just hold space for each other. And Elle had never had this before. Um, and as you can see, as the days went on, they really enjoyed sharing. Elle actually said, um, is one of the wisest young souls I've ever met. They actually said, uh, uh, we had asked, on day one, what do you hope you will get from camp and what do you fear will happen at camp? And I'll never forget their answer. Their answer was, I hope for self-discovery and I fear self-discovery. <laughs> um, and Elle got self-discovery. <laughs> In the middle of camp, uh, it was a really hot day and this is really significant. So it's 32 degrees and, and we had a big, big trek um, up and over a few mountain passes to an alpine lake. And Elle was really hot and, and said to me, hey, is it okay if I just wear my sports bra? And I said, hey, as long as you are covered and lathered up in sunscreen, because nobody gets a melanoma on my watch, you can wear whatever you want. And they said, really? And I said, yeah. And they had been taught that, that, that they should not um, show off their body. And what happened on this trek in particular is after they took off their shirt, they went from walking like this to this arms back and by the this is at the end of our hike they were just electric they also showed us over the course of um camp that they were quite an artist and this is l drawing little watercolor tattoos on everyone and and uh became someone who who everyone was just enamored by their create creativity this is one of my favorite conversations with l this is after uh, we arrived at an alpine lake they went for a dip with their new friends and they came up to me after and they said to me Tim I've had an epiphany in these mountains and in this lake and I said tell me what what is the epiphany and they said I was in that water and I looked at my body and I looked at my scars and you can see here Elle has significant scarring from self-harm I looked at my body 
and they looked at my scars and I just felt like we were friends. I feel a little, uh, I feel a little thing in my throat right here when, when, um, when she said it and still when I talk about it, I felt like we were friends for the first time ever. The rest of camp to again, give you the Reader's Digest condensed version. <laughs> Elle became freer and freer, connected more and more with themselves and with others um, to the point where here we are in the last day, just dancing, feeling. Um, and Elle has actually created a great friendship with, with this youth so much so that they're building a business together right now, which is really beautiful. That is actually about living on the land and using the land as a source of love and community. So it, it's pretty spectacular. Um, at the end of camp, the very last day when I, when I gave Elle a hug and, and sent them off back to their family, I, I said to her as we're, as we're embracing, I, I, I said to them as we were embracing, uh, listen, I, I would like to challenge you to remove crazy from your vocabulary and how you speak to yourself. And Elle being who Elle is, um, uh, gave me this wry smile and a little wink and said, oh, but I am crazy. And before I could say anything, they said, I am crazy creative. I am crazy kind. I'm crazy cool. <laughs> and, uh, and I could see that, that it had resonated with her at this time, um, resonated with them. And so full circle, Elle went home, applied to um, a college, an art college that they had um, told us at camp that they had dreamed of attending, but you know, who would care about their art? Um, they got in, they've since graduated, they've become a graphic designer, they moved uh, to a rural community to be out in the land. Um, and just this year, a few weeks ago, Elle applied to become a camp leader at Girl in the Wild. And this is part of their uh, application letter to me. Elle said, being me came with a lot of challenges. I feel like I became whole when I accepted myself seeing how much this ability to be changed my life. I want more than anything to teach youth how to be. Kim, what you do emphasizes this. At camp, I learned to be and to be unapologetically. This changed my life. Um, oh, things like that always make me feel like we're doing really great work. So why mountains? It's one story. Elle is a remarkable human who continues to move through the world in, in a beautiful and unapologetic way. Um, and I believe solely that that part of her journey in the mountains um, was a big um, a big motivator to help Elle see their value. So we go to the mountains because the mountain, mountains show us what we're capable of, both physically and emotionally. It's a raw place where there's no one but yourself and who you're with to to move through them. Um, uh, we thrive when we work together there. We always say um, no lion left behind at camp. We work together, no lion left behind. And what happens is these strangers show up at camp um, and they look at each other on day one and they think, oh my God, what have I got myself into? Who are all these weird and wacky people? This is gonna be awful. And then by working together and moving through these mountains together for a week, they connect on a soul level, um, both with the land, with each other, and with themselves. Here in the mountains, bodies are just vessels, so nobody talks about the size of their pants, or they're too tall, or too short, or too fat, or too thin. Their bodies just move them, and what we find is that, again, on day one, they look at these incredible mountains, and they think, oh my god, how are we ever going to move through these mountains? And on day seven, they're like, huh, I did that. My body did that. My body is incredible. Food is fuel here. So it's not something that we say, we're not going to take two helpings or I couldn't eat that. That's too much food or how many calories. It's just, if we're hungry, we eat and it helps us move through the world. And it really is healing. We had one youth who came um, with severe eating disorders. And just one of the things they said at the end was, I'm excited to go home and make a meal with my mother. I haven't done that in years. And I just I think I want to make a meal with her. And it was because one of the meals had reminded her of something her mom had made that she's refused to eat for years. There's little connections like that. Um, in the mountains, we give the heavy stuff to the wind is what we say. So really you just have space to be and to take an anvil off your chest and say, here it is to think. 
and in kind of society and where where youth are right now it's so busy there's no time for quiet and it is the quiet times that we have at camp that are actually the most uncomfortable for the youth in the beginning and become the most cherished in the end and we see that in our surveys um, we go to the mountains and of course just to connect with the earth to ground um, with where we came from and and what we find is that in in moving through these mountains these youth build a respect and love for mother earth that they have, did not show up with and this channels compassion for the land and for people moving forward in their lives so it it's um it just makes sense to us that this work is done in the mountains and with the mountains um and uh, we hope that what the mountains give these youth in terms of healing is something that we give back um, in terms of love and compassion from this confident group of youth moving forward. And that is it. <laughs> Thank you. For wow. Time. Thank you so much, Kim. That sounds absolutely amazing, the work that you're doing. Um, I'm going to. Um, turn it over now to our final panelist. Um, Ava Hamilton is going to return to the screen. She helped open our time together in a good way, and she's now going to share her uh, working experiences with um, how she is also moving mountains in her world. Thank you, Ava. Thank you. Um, everyone is doing really beautiful work, and I appreciate learning about it and meeting you all here. Um, my work is, uh, it's not really work, it's love, it's love of life. And um, what I'm doing is community work because we are in jeopardy. Uh, all life is in jeopardy right now on our planet, on Mother Earth. And we all need to work together as relatives, as human beings, and as part of the life cycle cycle of life we're not more important than um, any other living thing and there are many living things on our planet that we need to take care of and have respect for and uh, growing up as uh, a young Arapaho woman I, I learned a lot of things but you know where I really were, learned a lot was from my peers because uh, I, I, I didn't have time to listen to those old people you know I wanted to play run around and play outside and um, this I'm speaking of when I was kind of like in a junior high age when you were supposed to uh, help to take care of your elders you know give them coffee help them with whatever they wanted and that was our responsibility and I just wanted to uh, go out and play so one of the things that we uh Older people regret regret is that we didn't pay attention to uh, take time to pay attention. And anyway, I'm one of those characters who didn't. And I but I've learned a lot. And one of the um, things uh, that I've learned is that um, from elders, it, it, it's from elders of many tribes, uh, is to be a good listener. And um, a lot of times people like Ataya, uh, people don't want to listen to me. They don't want to believe what I, ha what I have to say. But it's, um, I paid attention when I uh, needed to pay attention as an adult and to retain that knowledge. And our knowledge is really um, precious. And it should, I'm never going, going to write a book, though people often encourage me to um, write a book about the knowledge that I have uh, from different tribes around the country. And this is has to do with language. Um, like there's one tribe, uh, particularly the Navajo say that if you are a fluent Navajo speaker, then when you go to college, uh, taking science and math it makes it easier. So language has uh, uh, other benefits beyond uh, indigenous knowledge, tribal knowledge is uh, but it also helps us to uh, retain our relationship to the land. And somebody from Atea's uh, tribe was one of my mentors, uh, Clifford Duncan. And I learned a lot from him. And um, 
there's a small video that the Museum of uh, Discovery in Fort Collins made, and it, it was called, it's called a meeting in the center with respect. And that's what we need to do is to meet all of the people, all of the humans on our planet need to come together and meet with respect for all life. And so that's some of the, some of the uh, talk that talks that I do with the community around here. And um, I think learning the dialogue and presenting myself as a, a community scientist uh, really inspires a lot of people. Yes, step right up. I have young high school girls um, who are doing things uh, on their own. I didn't influence them to do this, but they are, uh, we are like a team. Uh, they're high school kids, high school girls. And then the last place I spoke, there were junior high boys. So we need to include, and, and here's what they did. They came after I finished my talk, they came up and introduced themselves and shook my hand and introduced me to their parents. So it wasn't that their parents took them there or made them go there. They wanted to go there and listen and they listened, they're good listeners. So in order for us to be supportive and to really learn um, about life, about protecting life and about moving mountains, I mean, that's true. It, we need to listen to, to the earth. We need to listen to uh, everything that's alive around us to, in order to do a better job uh, than we have been. I mean, that's, uh, I'm not talking about this particular group of people, but uh, all of humanity around the planet, uh, all of the disturbances that we're having to overcome um, because we didn't listen to the earth. It was the earth, our mother, was seen as um, a place to benefit the economy. And it's not that, it's not that at all. Um, so I have a lot to say and I do a lot of public speaking and I'll try to keep it brief here, but I'll, I'll share some of the things that I've learned. And um, once uh, as a filmmaker, I was gonna be able to work with organizing a, um, a film festival, but like two or three days before I got extremely ill. I got a bronchitis and pneumonia. I could barely talk. I was miserable. And I uh, was, went over to my friend's place and I was crying to her. You know, I finally get to do work that I love and know how to do. And I'm too sick to go. I'm going to have to pass this opportunity. So she invited me to um, come back the next day. She was going to make me some soup. So I did go over there and it was a large bowl of soup. She said, you have to sit there and eat that whole bowl of soup. So I did, and I was very sick. I had a fever. I was just uh, really in bad shape. But by the time I finished that bowl, I was well. I was completely well. I had no bronchitis, no pneumonia. And I said, what is this magic soup? I said, you should sell it. You know, we could get rid of diseases, you know, be a magical cure. And here's what she said. She said, when I went to the store, I picked out my vegetables. I was praying for each vegetable. And then when I was cooking it, I was cooking, praying and cooking uh, for you to heal and to get well so that you could go do this job. And um, that's what we have to do. We have to work together and our words and our our um, our voices, our prayers, if you pray, or, or whatever it is, you communicate with all life. Um, that's what we have to do. We have to communicate and respect and love each other, all humanity and all life. And that's, people want to hear that message. And I live in an urban area where there's mostly white people. And, you know, I'm, when sometimes I ask them, you know, what, what is, what is your culture? What do you do in your culture? And a lot of times it makes me sad. We don't have a culture, they say. We, we have jobs. And um, so, but every weekend, almost every single weekend, I'm with the uh, uh, indigenous people singing and where there's dancing and ceremony or we're eating. And we're very active in that, uh, keeping our world alive. And I want that for everybody. I keep saying, uh, to people around here. Um, what is Boulder's song? What is Boulder's dance? 
uh, we don't, you know, that we can all do together and not as, uh, you know, that we want to be together and recognize uh, our humanity. Right now, I, um, I work for the city of Boulder as a community connector. It's just a very minimal uh, hours, but we uh, represent our communities. Uh, and there are many, what you call minority communities, people of color. It's taken away our humanity by being called a minority, which is a number, or a color, which is, you know, a color. Uh, we are not we are not that, we are more than that. We are, uh, I'm Arapaho, there are many tribes here. The statistics say there are over 200 tribes along the front range here of the Rocky Mountains, like Fort Collins to uh, Pueblo in the urban area. And there are, uh, I've heard between 100 and 300,000 urban Indians here in this area. That's a lot. And the numbers are 74% of all indigenous people in the United States live in urban areas. So most people live away from their tribal areas. And, um, but we still wanna be who we are. That's why I think this urban communities, the urban communities are very active and uh, like powwows. And now they're uh, having uh, gardens and they take us, take care of us very well. The, the last delivery of um, food as an elder, my husband and I get uh, food with a steak, elk steak and beer. Before that, we got uh, blue corn, um, dried corn and um, other, other what we consider to be indigenous foods. So we, we're paying attention to each other and um, even though we live where uh, it's not considered to be um, tribal lands, it is uh, because all of this is all of our ancestral land for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And so wherever we live, we are at home, even though um, what is now called a title, title to land ownership is not held by us in the urban areas. But we um, we are starting to have relationships with not only cities but uh, urban uh, mountain communities um, who want us to have a relationship um, that we were not able to have because of private land ownership. So there's a lot going on uh, in all all of our community, and I'm I'm glad to be a part of that. I um, the group that I belong to is a nonprofit. We recently uh, received a, a nonprofit status, uh, People of the Sacred Land. And one of our um, uh, ideas is to uh, seek out land uh, that we can um, take care of and eventually have our own herd of buffalo in the same way that tribes do. Um, we as individuals do not have the same uh, rights that tribes do. So um, we work harder to be a community here than uh, many tribes do. And this is a very large area, really active area. And uh, I'm very happy to be uh, part of this dialogue, uh, this kind of international national dialogue, because we're talking about our mother, the earth, and we are, and she is in severe uh, danger from, from us, from life. And there's so much more that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ava. Uh, that really highlights the, the, the scope, the, there's so many layers to the issues that we face with the environment, with conservation and the, it starts, with the social networks that we have and the relationships we have with each other and the the health that we have uh, with the relationships within ourselves in our, our chat um i put a question in and and it made me really think and i don't know if if somebody or if you all want to answer it but um everybody here on our panel is at a different place in their path um from youth to elders and um, scientists and um attacking the problems through um through a social perspective and all you you've all involved the environment and, and nature um, in some way and everyone needs to start somewhere 
Um, so some of our audience are just starting on their path and, and others are maybe already in a role where they have the opportunity to lead others. Um, but in what ways do you see opportunities for women and young women to come into the spaces that you work in? And that's a pretty, that's a really broad question, but um, you know, one of our, our, one of our audience was asking, you know, how they, how their organization can reach out um, and, and work, you know, and, and to reach out and connect with indigenous communities. And um, that, that's, you know, but how, what would you say to somebody who, um, who wanted to, to, to start and take action now and, and be involved? And I don't know if, if, we, if, you could, if you all want to jump in or if you want to, who wants to go first, if you have some, some advice or guidance to offer so that some, we can, like, like Ava was saying, that we can leave with, um, not just another meeting, but moving on towards action. I'll jump in. Um, I think what I say in the simplest form is, is just do it. You know, we see so many youth in our program who come and they say, well, because of X, Y, and Z, I probably don't belong in this space, or, you know, I'm not capable, or we tell ourselves these stories. Um, but we all offer something, even in our in our infancy in this in this um, kind of world, right? Or in our infancy in knowledge, we all offer something. And I think um, you know what we the way that we guide the youth that come to our program is really to like feel into your heart. And if you want to be in this space and you are interested in this, or you think you have value to add here, or you just want to learn because it's you're curious about it, but where do you begin? knock on a door, send an email, ask a question, use your voice, because your voice deserves to be heard. Thank you. Yeah, and I, um, I'd like to add that we, so we've made a lot of effort to work with, we've been trying to cultivate and hire young people and grow them into the organization. And it's it's been difficult over the last 10 years. and we decided to take a different tact of really working through an internship program to get to know young people when they're in school and get to start working with them and um, bring people on board. It, particularly for our work in Mexico, we wanted to hire folks in Mexico to do the work in Mexico and we're finding that we were finding this gap. And so we really um, have put attention toward you know working with people when they're still in school and women in particular in Mexico. Um, uh, yeah, so I think there's ways, and I think it's really important too, we've put a lot of attention to making the space welcoming for young people and making sure they understand that their voice and what they bring is valued. I think um, for me, I've learned over the years that having a fresh perspective in conversations about solving big conservation problems can be so important Important. You don't necessarily need to be an expert. You know, your fresh perspective can make such a difference. So that's my two cents. Um, I can jump in. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, I talked a little bit about language, um, but it's really something that I is really central to my work. And I think can be a glue that holds a lot of folks together. So my tribe recently started doing online language classes, just really grassroots, like we don't have a lesson plan, it's just elders who speak and people who wanna learn. And the interesting thing is that I like 90% of us are women or, um, or two-spirit folks um, or non-binary folks or queer um, gendered men. Um, and it's so interesting to me because um, that it's all that it's all women. It's usually women elders and you know women, young women. Um, and one of the powerful things that um, an elder who teaches our language class um, says is that there's no right way to say something in you. Like there can be 20, 30 different ways to say the same phrase. And um, she always says, you know, and they're all right. You can say it that way. Yeah, you can say it that way too. And, you know, even just with the definition of a word or the way someone says a word, each family does it differently. 
Um, and she always says, yeah, that's right too. Yeah, you can do it that way. And I feel like that's such a big contrast to English where I feel like when we're students in English, it's no, you can't say it that way. You can't, nope, nope, that's wrong. Just the notion of wrong doesn't even exist in you. And so I think having that different um, paradigm really helps bring in um, that helps enable people to feel more comfortable just trying something out, you know, and um, trying to string words together and trying to make a sentence because it's really hard. And, and so I think carrying that principle outside of you into other areas of there not being a wrong thing, a wrong way to do something or say something can really help bring in all the different perspectives that people have. And then also in you, you know, in English, I feel like there's definitely words that have a preference for the male, you know, human. Um, and uh, in you, it's it's all the same ending. It's a ch for anything that's alive, and it extends not only to like mamach woman and tavach man, but all of the animal species end with the ch. So that's another way that we're the same as the animals, you know. Uh, musach is cat. And so anything that's alive ends with the ch. And I think that's one way that everything is viewed as equal, you know, men and women. And like I mentioned in my talk, you know, um, there's just a lot of honoring and valuing of the female in youth culture. And I think that also really helps. It helps me to see, you know, my women elders um, speaking up and, and talking and feeling free to share their opinion. Cause you know, I feel like you don't see as much of that in Western culture, women are seen as, you know, less than, but it's, it's different in youth. And I think that really helps our women to get more involved and um, yeah, to just feel equal to men. So those are my thoughts. Wow, that, uh, that's a, a really amazing to hear the everything that's life and, and living is connected and equal through the lang the way that language is spoken. And I think that's that's definitely something that's missing for sure in, uh, for example, in, in English language. So, um, Eva, did you want to add to that at all? Well, um, in, in the Rapaho way, uh, and I didn't hear this when I was young, I heard it uh, quite recently as, a, as an old woman. Uh, people my age, women my age are concerned that our knowledge, that the knowledge that we learned growing up, and there was a lot, I mean, um, you know, like if, if you're walking and there was a, a, a with a group of people and there's like a tree or a pole or something we were all supposed to go to the same side because if you split and went uh, on either side of it then uh, it would uh, you would have some sort of disagreement in the in the future but just simple things like that you know so we uh, um, we learned that um, there are two essential things for life and um, one of them is water and the other is women our women you know that we are the givers of life and um so they're held in high respect high regard uh even you know even though christianity kind of came and changed that um i think we're in a in a period right now where more attention is being paid to um our philosophies our cultures uh more more that more so than just public education which is for a lot of us that was uh where we learned history and we didn't know that we had more history than that you know um if somebody had asked me at the time do you know your people have lived here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years no i wouldn't have known that because uh you know christopher columbus uh discovered this world and um you know i never thought beyond that and so now those kind of things are being uh, uh explained and corrected and i'm very happy with that and it seems like there's a, there's a great deal i mean not everybody is always going to agree all the time and that's humanity and um and that's a really uh, difficult place to be when you're advocating for change which which I am you know I want us to to uh, use our human intelligence which I think 
uh, is kind of getting uh, brushed to the side because of a uh, uh, technology and um, let's use it because there's and there are answers in there in within here this this physical body uh, that we uh, if we pay attention if we think about it use those quiet times you know i'm i'm having an idea that why don't we have uh, camps all across the country uh, for young people to have uh, to spend time uh, with uh, without technology and with the earth and learning about to communicate with it because really if you listen uh, you will learn things from the earth uh, just by listening and paying attention. I have a Sioux friend, a uh, Lakota friend who lives here in Denver, and she um, told me, she said, uh, you know, our, our mother breathes is a living spirit, and so she breathes. And sometimes uh, you can see when she's breathing in and out because the mountains will be bigger. And it took me a couple of years of observation to see, finally see that when the earth is breathing, you can actually see it. So if you pay attention to those kind of things, to the earth, the earth speaks to us and we're not paying, paying enough attention. I mean, I need to pay more attention because I like being an urban. I like, <laughs> I like going to the grocery store and buying packaged foods and buying gas and driving around all of that stuff and we have to figure that part out so that um, we are not so dependent on the economy and all that it entails um, and really get back to trying to be more respectful of uh, the life as it comes to us. I'm talking about food sustainability, uh, human sustainability and uh, just all life um, there's so much more uh, and everybody seems to be willing to listen to everybody now I mean I'm feeling that um, that's why I get invited to uh, do a lot of speaking around the area and um, I, I think it's a really good time for us to really jump in together and um, make changes and some of that is not going on. I have a friend here. He uh, there's a ten year project, and he's going. It's a White House uh, funded project. Uh, millions of dollars are invested in this to discuss what we can do. And to me, it's almost the same thing as the same people, same guys, uh, saying the same thing. And what is going to change? Do they need ten years? We know. We know what we need to do. Uh, I've, I ask that question all the time in my public speaking to the audience. What can we do? Let's community. You're my community. We all live here. We, we love these mountains. We love this planet. What can we do to take care, to be better caretakers? And one is um, let's stop everything for a year. Let's just, you know, like COVID made us do. Let's stop everything. We can do it. And then, um, so I haven't figured that one out. But the other one is you do what you can every single day as an individual. You do that. You do your own work. And I've heard that here too today. And so um, I know that's something that I need to be doing and, and, and not so much reaching out for. Uh, right now, today, I could do it as, as an individual, not look to the community to make great change if it starts with us. So um, it's it's a very important concerning time for all life. So I think we're on it and I I love I love life and I love what I can see and um, paying attention to our young people to help them to um, so when we help them that they have all this to enjoy as well all of this life. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. 
wow, we've heard some amazing, um, not just stories, but like real life, you know, um, work and, and action and it's it's continuing on and and um like Ava, there is a call to action you know and it starts with each each one of us and not waiting for our community or our government to take action but uh, what can we each do now um i just want to also just prompt the audience um if you have questions um please put them put them in the the chat or the q a and um and we'll um see if uh, our speakers can answer. Um, we um, there's just there's so, there's such a the scope of of what you've all presented today is so broad, and yet it's that you know the connection, the social barriers, and the the connections and those issues there are really um, what's what sort of strings it throughout. And something that comes to my mind, um, Kim mentioned um, the moment where. Um, Elle took her shirt off and that that changed something, you know, and it, it's hard because we can't always go to the mountains or be in um, a, in a group in that safe way to 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 make the change or to be, um, you know, and, and there's other things, you know, that, you know, as we're like, you know, like Ava says, we're living in um, our urban areas and you know, we can't always get out of our urban areas or you can't get out of you may not see that you can get out of. Where, where what you're in what are what are some other you know other ways or things you can say to people who are listening um you know um how they might go about you know um lifting that that barrier or that weight um you know that that l felt you know and and how you might um you know, and i think one of the things that I, I liked hearing from kim before was you know the the trickle out after after camp, I think we had spoken about this on the phone. Um, when when girls, the youth, leave camp, and how that connection and how that change, um, you know, you know, forms a web, and you know, they they catch other people in their change in their community, and and it, it's it goes outwards from there. You know, what else can what can other people do, um, you know, to help make those changes? But obviously, it starts with with initiating those actions with yourself and. If you have any other sub thoughts, suggestions? I think that is a huge question that I don't know that I have the answer to. I think, um, yeah, the mountains always give us space to move through these things and to get to those epiphanies, right? But we can certainly get to those epiphanies in, in our own space. Um, but there's not, um, in, in my opinion, anyways, a quick one, two, three step. If you just do these things, you'll sort out that thing and everything will be fine. But I think on a bigger level as, as women, we can come to together and create just safe spaces in the way that we connect with each other in the way that we can break down these societal barriers that have been put up where we are taught to compete and compare. We can, um, create those environments and connections and communications with other women, other girls, youth, to just model the behavior of, of um, when we feel it, feeling confident moving forward. And I know for myself as a youth, when I would see a confident woman moving forward, that is something I'm like, how do I get to there? How do I get to there? And I think modeling the behavior is, is really important. I think it's all a bit of a pendulum, right? And so sometimes we're over here and we, we feel so low about ourselves, we, we can't quite get to like a really nice spot. So when we see someone like that, let's move over. When we do have the space and, and the awareness, just come over and meet them where they're at and work together. And I think I, like none of this could be done alone. I think this is like, we're all in this, like together as women, as humans, on the earth as animals, it's, it's so important. So I'm not answering your question at all, Nicole. I just think <laughs> I, there's, I don't, I don't know what the quick fix is. I see so many transitions and transformations and epiphanies happen at camp. And I also see some of those journeys are longer and they happen after camp and they need some baby steps and they need some support. And sometimes you go down and sometimes you go up. But I think if we can model behavior um, and come together collectively, this is how we move forward. Thank you, Kim. I think that was, oh, sorry, Julia, yeah. Hi, I just wanted to, uh, I've appreciated everyone's comments so much. So thank you so much. Um, 
I wanted to add on to that idea of role models and also just encourage everyone to um, seek out mentors and also to be a mentor yourself and to others. And I think, um, you know, having women that support us and that we can support is, you know, really vital. So um, here we are supporting each other, but really individually in 101, I think that type of mentorship, um, no matter what your age is, you can be a mentor and a mentee at the same time to different people. And I think that's seems to be very critical in, in, in elevating girls and women. Yes, I, I completely agree. And I think that's one of the reasons why we, we have everybody here today. All, everybody here is a leader in, in doing what they're doing and can offer a different perspective on, on, um, on that. And, and yeah, I did. I really love this conversation um, that Kim and Julia are bringing up about mentorship. And I just wanted to offer, um, you know, a, a, a personal story around that, that I, um, it really was the guidance of um, a female elder that helped me come into being um, proud to be Native American and specifically a you woman, because I grew up feeling like white people were better than me and they were smarter than me and that there was no knowledge in, in like, who I am. Um, and it wasn't until I was around 20 that I heard this, um, you elders say with just like so much happiness, I'm so glad to be a youth woman and I wouldn't want to be anything else. And then that just touched me because I was like, oh, wow, okay. And she was also one of my first language teachers. She's passed away now, but um, but it that was a real turning moment for me that helped me see the knowledge that comes um, just in my body from being of the mountains, from being of the land. And our language, we say, comes from the land. And so all of the knowledge that's just held within that and to see an elder embodying that just helped me to come into my own. And so, yeah, the question of if we can't be in the mountains, I think being around people that, that have that and that are able to share that. And just that really connects to what Kim and Julia were saying that like we need mentors, we need mentorship because um, that can help us find, find the way. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over now to um, Canadian Mountain Network Executive Director Monique Dubay to share some closing comments with everybody. Thanks, Nicole. Um, thank you all very much for your for your time and your your wisdom. Um, the Canadian Mountain Network is proud and honored to partner on International Mountain Day with the Mountain Sentinels um, Alliance. We are collaborators. We are partners. Um, the Canadian Mountain Network started out as a network centers of excellence funded by the government of Canada for five years to do mountain research. And what we've really become good at is funding indigenous led and co-led research. Everything from caribou to water, to watersheds, to reintroduction of, of um, bison into Banff National Park. Um, um, the braiding of knowledge is to really truly influence decision making and policy and regulation in 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 Canada and also working with our partners across our international borders um, uh, for 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 lessons learned and so you know as I reflect on International Mountain Day and and women who move mountains, I want to start by thanking all of you women and the team uh, who pulled this together. Um, um, we appreciate you and we thank you um, for this. Um, a special thanks as well to, um, to Cora and to Louise and Ataya, Kim and, and Ava for your for contributions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I heard things like purpose, leadership, partnerships, accountability, responsibility, and, and action. And why, why does that, why do those words resonate with women? Um, and I think it's because, you know, women I've learned through my experiences, we are tend to be, tend to be more integrated, more holistic thinkers, awareness, um, empathetic. We have a strength. I think you used the word power. 
um, we understand the value of community and why is that? And I think it's because of our shared experience. Um, you know, I've been a scientist for a very long time. I've, I've worked and walked in the shoes. I am a settler. Um, and I recognize my limitations as a settler. I've walked in the shoes of some of the highest levels of, of government and industry. Um, and I have suffered professionally, I've suffered personally, and those experiences have the experience of being the only woman in the room, the experiences of being of, of the repercussions when you speak about, um, you know, I've worked in the oil sands of Alberta in my career. So when you speak and you stand in an environment like that, there are repercussions and you learn, you learn from that. And I think as women, we have, when it comes to mentorship that we've talked about, doesn't matter what age or where you come from, whenever you think you've had an experience that's only your own, um, remember there's always someone else out there that has had that experience and tapping into those lessons and options and experience so you can process it and help you with your own path. I think is critical and, and women have that. Um, women tend to work in that nexus space, that space. So we heard it today of, you know, resource development, economic development, community sustainability, environmental preservation, um, multi-jurisdictions, women that have suffered with identity, self-loathing. We tend to be right in that nexus. And how do we, how do we as women with purpose and leadership and partners and accountability and responsibility and action, how do we work that nexus? Well, one of the lessons I've learned and is where my heart is now is in the braiding of knowledges. Um, there is you know, and, and when I say I, the greatest lesson I have learned is that I am extremely limited as a settler. Um, I have a mentor who is an Indigenous elder woman who has gifted me with, with wisdom and insights that I didn't even know existed. And Ava, you speak of spirit, you speak of culture and community, and there is, um, there is a whole life, there's a whole existence out there that I feel that I've, I've just had the privilege of observing now at this stage in my career. The lessons in the language, Ataya, that you spoke of, the history, just even how we relate and the, the, the history of that language and what it means in terms of equity and diversity um, is really important. So the braiding of knowledges, I think in what we do, how we work together, how we bring women to camps, you know, the Canadian Mountain Network, we fund a lot of research on land-based learning, um, place-based um, research, all in the interest of reconciliation, honoring our commitments to each other, little steps on the path to betterment, being accountable for the actions and the actions of our ancestors, building a legacy that's better than what we've inherited and trying to achieve that balance. That is why we are here. And this is why we have to uplift each other. Um, that, is, that is the strength. And I think it was you, Ava, that said, we need to pay attention to each other. So on that note, again, a gracious thank you to you all. And in terms of paying attention to each other, there is one woman on this panel that I'm particularly close to, that is Kim McMullen. And she and I got to know each other running through the mountains. And Kim, um, Kim has made it her life mission to develop Girl in the Wild from her own bank account. She's a single mother of two. This woman works harder through more challenges than I could ever imagine. Girl in the Wild has had impacts to women that have suffered more than most women or groups of women do in a lifetime, these young women. So in order for Girl in the Wild to survive, they need funding, they need support, they need donations. So the Canadian Mountain Network has donated $5,000 towards Girl in the Wild. It's a drop in the bucket. 
but I'm going to challenge all of you here in the interest of paying attention to each other. Um, we all are doing amazing things. Today, I would like to put my energy towards Kim and Girl in the Wild because I know Girl in the Wild needs us to pay attention and to give it a boost when it needs it most so that we can get more girls to camps in the mountains. So through your networks, through your ability to even just raise awareness of Girl in the Wild, if you're interested in making a donation of any shape, size, or form, I challenge you and I encourage you to work towards uplifting Girl in the Wild today and the honor of International Mountain Day uh, and doing what we do best, which is supporting um, each other. So on that, I turn it back to you, Nicole. Thank you, Monique. And I'm gonna turn it over to Julia to also offer some closing remarks from the Mountain Sentinels Alliance. So, um, hi everyone. Happy Mountain Day, International Mountain Day, woo! What a day to celebrate, um, celebrate the mountains, celebrate these amazing women. And um, I am just so grateful to be here. I wanted to take the opportunity to thank the Canadian Mountain Network. Just love that organization and all the individuals there. Our amazing team at Mountain Sentinels who put this together, our illustrious panelists, and just all of you who've gathered for this session. Um, I do represent one of today's sponsors, the Mountain Sentinels. Alliance. I had a, a few slides, but I'll just say that our um, we're comprised of Indigenous rights holders, academics, community knowledge holders, practitioners, educators, students, and decision makers from six continents and 50 different countries. Um, so we're an, a large alliance funded by the U.S. National Science Foundation, and we aim to, to build an alliance of equitable and inclusive partnerships that learn from each other in incorporate multiple worldviews and knowledges uh, that co-create new knowledge and innovations and together advanced a shared vision for catalyzing pathways to sustainability in mountain regions worldwide. We do a lot of different things. We do have a fellowship program and I wanted to highlight this because that is one place where we are um, supporting uh, men and women, but also we specifically in our last round had a lot of indigenous women that we supported from um, native indigenous people in Hawaii and Appalachia and also in Central Asia and Peru and all over the world, individuals doing amazing work for their communities. So Mountain Sentinels was co-founded by about five women a decade ago, and now we represent both Indigenous and non-Indigenous team of kind of women leaders, I guess. Um, personally, you know, we've all had our different struggles. I, as an assistant professor, um, it was just the time of my life when I was having kids and I had three different kids as an assistant professor. and. It was a struggle to keep my job and my tenure clock kept on ticking and um, you know I feel for women that I see in that position today and and I, I, I try to help because that's there's a lot of challenges that women face. But despite our challenges, I think women really have the ability to change the world um, we're collaborative, we know it takes a village to do our work to raise our kids to gather the water, the food, to nourish ourselves and others. We're constantly multitasking. We take care of our elders and Mother Earth and, and we know how to collaborate. We value peace and justice. Often we're kind of behind the scenes, but we are tough and resilient and we don't back down. So I am so inspired by these panelists today um, and all of the work they've done. Our elder Ava, had a really beautiful opening and shared her story. I loved how she said, you know, work is love. And she really talked, used the word love a lot. And I think that is a concept that's really important to transforming our future and one that especially women would bring that to the table. So um, I really value so much of what she brought to the conversation, the value of community work um, and being a good listener. Cora talked about, you know, changing policy based on Indigenous women identifying problems and making change and really reclaiming Indigenous women's role. And I really, um, you know, thought that she had some great lessons and her organization is doing so much. Louise really shared with us her critical transboundary work 
and the importance of working with diverse people to protect unique landscapes and stopping violence against the land that this border wall is imposing. Um, Atea said so much, introducing her family. I really appreciate that she called her family into this conversation. That was really a meaningful moment for me. Um, I really also appreciated her uplifting her, the in, endangered indigenous language and sharing how her culture uplifts, uplifts women and their role in giving life. And um, I think we have a lot to learn from her culture. Um, she shared so many different things with us. You know, Kim, the story of Elle and her success in emphasizing this connection with the land and each other at a soul level. Again, I really, that really resonated with me um, because for me, mountains are the soul of the earth and we are all connected in that way. Um, Monique talked about reconciliation and braiding knowledge and accountability and, and uplifting each other. And so um, I just feel really happy to be a, a part of this group and you've really given us such gifts today. So I just wanted to thank you all for that. And I'd like to encourage us to use this International Mountain Day to pledge, you know, to collect our energies and strength and to support each other and amplify our voices. And Monique gave a very concrete example of how we could do that with Girl in the Wild. Um, we could even start a declaration from women from the mountains worldwide as a starting point. So if anyone wants to pursue that, let me know, panelists or you know, participants as well. Um, you know, really, what is the change that we want to see and how do we get there? How do we demand that systemic change? So I'd like to encourage everyone here to um, write in the chat one action that you will do to advance women and mountains and, and create this systemic change. I think, can everyone, are, are um, non-panelists able to write in the chat as well? Yes. Okay. So let's all just kind of write one thing that you pledge to do. Um, whether it's a donation to Girls in the Wild or something else. Because um, I, I really hope that this conversation can go beyond this inspiring session so that together we can move mountains, because women move mountains. So thank you all for being here and just, I can't express my gratitude for your time and everything you do. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I do want to say and extend another thank you to all of our speakers and attendees and the background production team for putting this together today. I think there's been just so much experience and wisdom and, and shared with us today. Um, I'm really look, I'm inspired and I'm, I'm hoping that everyone isn't just inspired. I'm hoping that everyone leaves this uh, today and goes out and, and starts to move those mountains in, in the ways that they that they can. So I really appreciate that. Um, I do want to do a really quick shout out to our sponsors. Um, we had quite a few organizations who donated um, items. We have been running um, a four week online contest for International Mountain Day. So it was great to have so many organizations uh, step up and support us. And do, do reach out and, and um, look up Girl in the Wild and um, help us send more girls to camp in the coming years. Uh, we know there are so many organizations out there who are working to uplift women in so many ways. So um, take a look at what's happening in your area. And um, our challenge to you is to donate to organizations like Girl in the Wild and, and um, uplift the youth because those are our future leaders. I'm gonna now turn it over to Ava one last time who is gonna close our time together. Thank you everyone for sharing your knowledges and your work and your, your humanity. It is very precious to me to be a part of this because we are all precious beings we get to have a life here and it looks, it sounds like we are all working in that regard. I wanna give thanks for all life. Thank you creator for giving us this day, for bringing together these women, for helping us to move mountains. 
because we have always been movers of mountains. This is why we are still all alive today, because of women. For thousands of years, it has been women who have given us life through working with Mother Earth. So thank you for all that you do, all that you are, and all that we can be and will do. Ho, ho, creator. <laughs>